Welcome to the Upland Nation podcast. I'm Scott Linden, your host. So glad you could join me. Yeah, we'll talk bird dogs. We'll talk bird hunting. We'll talk horses and how they help us become better bird hunters, practically and philosophically. That's the main topic for today. We'll be talking with Jeff Gillespie from Tinker Kennels, and uh, his operation is called Tinker Kennels and Rocking Horses Hunt Club. You've probably seen him on my show. You might have read some of the stuff I've written about him and his operation, uh, whether it's my own article or some of the others out there. So lots of advice on big running dogs, hunting prairie birds. It's all a part of the outdoor lifestyle here at the Upland Nation podcast. I'll also have some unsung public access providers that you might want to take a look at the next time you're, you know, trying to find something a little bit further off the beaten path. So, you know, if you love bird dogs and bird hunting and maybe horses, then you're in the right place. Thank you for joining me. Uh, A few comments from you as well. We'll get to those in just a moment. Uh, But first, how's your week going? How was your weekend? You know, I've been talking to you a lot on Facebook, asking a lot of questions about various things, uh, from happy hour celebrations to uh, your training goals. Uh, Over here, it's all about being steady on the fall of the bird. We're still working on that. It's a work in progress. Flick is doing pretty good. Fascinating situation yesterday you know i'm I'm putting you know what i'm using decoy weights you know duck decoy weights hobbling a bird with a weight on that bird flying them out of the launchers so that flick can see that bird fly 20 50 60 yards land in the grass or in our case in the sagebrush most of the time and stay steady well yesterday oh my yesterday that first pigeon and it ended up being the last pigeon as well uh he went about 75 yards crashed into the limb of a ponderosa pine the moment he crashed into it i thought oh great he's gonna get hung up there i'll never get him back no a cooper's hawk knocked him off the limb and so i steadied flick dashed all the way over there checking back in once in a while make sure he's still on a point got to the hawk got to the bird the hawk flew off the bird was unscathed picked him up brought him back left a dead chucker there because that's the whole point of this uh scenario is the dog gets bird in his mouth when he does a good job that all worked great flick ran out got the retrieve completed We had a good time. I'm walking back thinking, man, that bird is charmed. I ought to put him right back into the loft and wish him good luck. But no, I got greedy. And the lesson in it for you is don't be a greedy owner. I thought after that, Flick is, he's ready for the next test. So as we're in the driveway about ready to get back to the yard, I put that bird on the ground in front of him thinking, he's going to be steady again. That bird will fly off after he wanders around a little bit because that's the other challenge. But no, crashed in, got the bird. There goes all the learning for the day. Well, not really. We went back and and did some more. And uh, hopefully our two steps forward only resulted in one step backwards. Can you relate? Been there, done that? It's like going up a chucker hill you know you're sliding and scraping your way up and every time you take a step your foot hits the scree slope and it slides back another eight inches well that's what dog training is all about at least around here maybe for you too so good luck as ronnie smith advises me periodically don't get mad don't get frustrated just work with the dog speaking of working with the dogs On Facebook, I'm asking some questions, and uh, one of the ones I'm asked quite often myself, and I thought I'd ask you all, was, hey, what do you use for rewards when your dog does a good job, whether it's a long retrieve or steady to wing shot and fall or just coming to you when he's called? 
Got lots of great suggestions from food and water, of course, some of the things that we use in the desert a lot. Uh, Jack Gable had a great one. He said, many don't like this idea, but cutting something off the bird the dog just brought you and feeding it to him on the spot is pretty direct. Now he says some will argue it'll turn your dog into a hard mouth, but he doesn't think it's true and neither do a whole bunch of others. In fact, many of the trainers that I've been watching a lot of these days, and you know, back in the old days, quail heads became a pretty regular part of every hunting trip treat for a dog. So, you know, it's, you know, the stuff that used to work probably still works pretty well. I'm not going to argue that one, Jack. Thanks a lot for bringing it back to our attention. And then I asked about FaceTime, you know, in the broadest sense of the term, you know, uh, when wolf puppies uh, greet their dam as she's coming back after a hunt, the first thing they do is they get right up in her face. In that case, it's because they want some of whatever she ate so that they can eat it. You know how that works. Well, <laughs> Matt Templeton says, you'd think twice about giving your dog that kind of up close FaceTime. If you saw what my dog eats, and yeah, he's absolutely right. Don't forget to wash your hands and your face every time after, after that happens. Thanks a lot to everybody who contributes to those discussions on Facebook. Yeah, the Wing Shooting USA page and the Upland Nation page were active on both all the time. We being you and me and everybody else in our fraternity. All right, we've got Jeff Gillespie of Tinker Kennels and Rocking Horses Hunt Club coming right up. Just a couple brief messages. First from sageandbreaker.com, gun care products crafted at the highest caliber. If you're hoping for a great Father's Day gift, you better head on over there. They've got one called the Father's Day Bundle. Now, it's a big one. It has everything you'll need to clean any shotgun, anytime, anywhere. In fact, that's part of the joy of it. It's portable. It's self-contained. All sorts of other great gifts for you. It's all at sageandbreaker.com. Send the link to your significant other. Maybe that person can get you something for Father's Day at sageandbreaker.com. And welcome to my friends at Huron, South Dakota, the Ringneck Nation, more pheasants than people, 140,000 or so acres of public access. Learn more about all they have to offer in my favorite South Dakota hunting town at hunthuronsd.com. Yeah, I promised a good time. Yeehaw! Yeah, it's my rodeo background coming back again. My friend Jeff Gillespie from Tinker Kennels and Rocking Horses Hunt Club is joining us. You, like I said, you've read stories about my adventures out there on the grasslands with Jeff and with Bob Tinker in the past. Uh, you've seen a couple episodes we've done on the TV show, and maybe you've read more recently about him and his operation in some of the other magazines out there. Jeff, welcome to the Upland Nation podcast. Thank you, Scott. It's good to be here with you. Good to get caught up again. I miss you guys, and uh, you know, I just have so many fond memories. I'm not going to bore everybody with all of them, but I will be chiming in periodically with the things that I think are marvelous. I mean, by that I mean we marvel at the opportunities we get when we straddle a horse. So, so let's start with the whole backstory on Tinker Kennels and Rocking Horses Hunt Club. Why don't you tell me tell me how that all came about? Well, it, uh, it started five, six years ago. My wife, Teresa, was working with Bob, and Bob had the business at the time, which is how we met you, of course. Mm -hmm. um, and we spent some time there, and then eventually we started riding with Bob. And uh, from there, uh, I just grew to love the, love the dogs and love the horses and, and what he was doing. And uh, at, at one point, Bob said to me, hey, I'm – I'm retiring if you want in now's the time. So it was a little ahead of our schedule. We'd always decided that we wanted to do that. But, uh, you know, when, when you have the opportunity, you jump in and go for it. So, Well, and I'm glad you did. And, and I could see Bob saying exactly that and then probably take it or leave it. 
that's not right. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, since then, uh, you've covered a few miles, literally and figuratively. What? Uh, how's you know? Why don't you describe your operation uh, for those of us who are intrigued or maybe it's on our bucket list? Well, the. the the bottom line is the is the prairie grouse. There's the prairie chicken and the sharp-tailed grouse, and that's our main obsession. And um, when Bob started the business, and then as we continue it, uh, the obvious way to chase those birds would be to sit in a saddle and follow pointing dogs across the vast prairies in South Dakota. So. Um, that's what we do. We, we take folks out on our Tennessee walkers, we follow our English setters, and we look for those birds. Sometimes they're elusive and sometimes they're foolish, just like any other hunted bird. Yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, when I'm with you, they're elusive rather than <laughs> foolish. But I've, I, I got to tell you, I've had so much fun up out there. And, I, you know, that's why, uh, you know, I, I wrote that story for a gun dog magazine a few years back as well. <laughs> you know, I got to tell everybody out there that you, you change literally and figuratively your perspective on hunting changes when you're on top of a horse. It's not just the fact that you can see forever and enjoy the dog work. Um, it's you know the connection with history if you will uh there's all of that and more what do your clients generally tell you what do they get out of that experience it's uh it, just like you said you know when with with a hunt with us it's not necessarily about um whacking and stacking them up you know it's it's not about filling your your nine bird limit, whatever, you know, whatever it is for your group. Um, it's really about that experience, about being able to just sit back in the saddle and and listen to the horse's feet running through the grass um, and the crickets chirping and watching those dogs fan out in front of you back and forth and back and forth. So it's really the experience more than just a straight go hard and, and try to kill as much as you can. Uh, Jeff, one of the things that everybody asks me, and I, I try to address it uh, real close to the front of any discussion, is you don't really need to have ridden a horse before you go to Tinker Kennels, do you? No, no. Any, and, and we have clients that, you know, in, in the off-season, they will take riding lessons just, just for their own personal they enjoy it so sure. much, but but if you come to us, you know our horses are they're trained professionals. So, which is more than I can say for myself. But but they're they're, they're very well behaved, and they and they have a good autopilot. So. Yeah, they do. In fact, it's funny. I'll never forget. I was uh, dismounting uh, in a rush, as 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 it always is in those cases, and I dropped the reins on the horse I was on and uh, and started fumbling for shells as I was wor walking up on a pointing dog, and I turn around and right behind me is my horse, my loyal horse. Right. You know, if yeah. if they had a softer mouth, they could be a hell of a retriever. But if nothing else, they do hang around most of the time, don't they? Yes, they do. Yep. And typically, the ones the ones that don't want to hang around are the ones that I'm riding. So, and I don't get out of the saddle as much. So. Yeah, yeah. So we, uh, you know, so let's let's just go through a typical, um, you know, let's call it the concentrated, distilled down to its essence. Uh, the dogs are getting birdie. We're on horseback, and now what happens? Walk me through to the retrieve. Sure. Yeah. So we're uh, like, like you said, we're on horseback. We're watching those dogs. They're anywhere from two to 400 yards out. And uh, if they hit a point, this is, this is where the horseback thing comes in handy. If they're 400 yards out and they go on point, it's nice to be able to get there quick. And uh, with those walkers, they're nice and smooth getting up there. You can cover that ground quick. You get up there and at a certain point, so you don't spook those birds, you know, you hop out of the saddle, grab your gun and go. And uh, from there, you can walk up and, and push the birds and try to get a flush. So. Um, and just because this is the right time to mention it, no, you do not shoot while a horseback. Uh, these, the, the horses are bomb proof. They, they're used to gunfire, but you're climbing off and you're walking away from those horses. So yeah. 
that happens, then poof, woohoo, we get a retrieve out of that thing and, uh, and everybody's ready to go. And here's, here's the place where everybody gets a little nervous. How hard is it to get back onto that horse? <laughs> you get on the uphill side and you, and you get that horse to park out a little bit. There's nothing to it. So it's just, it's just like climbing up onto the bar a, after a night. Of, uh, <laughs> drinking, <so. laughs> it, it does help to, you know, if you've done some goblet squats or you're, you're doing some, uh, you know, leg presses or something, it does help a little bit about the 25th time you're remounting. Perfect. But, <laughs> but like you said, and, and, and you like, Tennessee walkers and I'll tell everybody why my veterinarian likes them so much. He says it's like riding the lazy boy. Uh, but there, uh, you know, why don't you explain the advantage to a Tennessee walker versus a quarter horse? And I've hunted off quarters as well. I've even hunted off mules and well, we won't debate that one, but anyway. (laughs) Well, yeah, the thing with the Tennessee walker and, and, and I, I do, I love all horses, but, um, the Tennessee Walker is just like a lazy boy. You know, they're you're out there sitting in a in a padded theater seat while you're while you're watching. As far as I'm concerned, the greatest show in the world with those dogs. They're smooth. Um, they have a pretty gait, and they have a great personality. And at the end of the day, you can look back and you can say, "Well, we we covered 15, 20 miles." I don't really notice it. You know, and 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 at at the end of a three day hunt, you're going to be stiff in places that you typically aren't stiff. But uh, that's just from the just from the way you're sitting in in the saddle, you know. And, and if you did it for more than three days, you'd be good to go. So, yeah, you do actually condition yourself over the course of time like that. But is there yeah. anything? I mean, if somebody was really gung ho about this and they they really wanted to, you know. To, to prepare in, in one way or another physically for a horseback hunt. Um, what would you tell them to do? I would say that the first and foremost, that it would be to condition yourself just as if you were going to go hunting without being on a horseback. Mm-hmm. And, and then from there, if you, if you have an opportunity to get in a saddle and do it most certainly, because the, the more comfortable you are around horses, uh, the better, you know, you can, you can enjoy what else is going on rather than, rather than trying to outthink yourself while you're sitting in the saddle. Yeah, it does help to, you know, uh, and I, I've admired some people, uh, both hunting for fun and hunting for the TV show that they're just so familiar with their shotgun. They don't even look at the dang thing. They just know where everything mm-hmm. is. It's, you know, and, and the same is uh, true of a horse, uh, whether it's, knowing how to get on and get off, um, knowing where your scabbard is, by the way, of course, your, your, your shotgun is in a scabbard and it's unloaded the whole time until you pull it out and you're walking up on a pointing dog. Um, all of those things help. What, what are the things that, uh, that people ask you about most when it comes to horses? You know, uh, I think it's pretty, I hate to say it's common knowledge because as soon as I say that, then somebody's going to say, well, I didn't know that. But, you know, basic um, safety around horses and riding horses, you know, if, if those horses are prey animals and and you have to be aware that their instincts are going to be to flee. And so you, you want to try to make sure that you're, you're not putting them in a position where they want to flee. Now, like I say, you know, our horses are, they're bomb proof. They really are. And, um, but walking around a horse, talking to them softly and, instead of being intense, um, just making buddies with them. I think most of the people that come out with us are, they either request a certain horse when they come back or they make buddies if they're out for the first time. And, and that's part of the, part of the adventure too. You know, when we used to have horses literally outside the back door at our place, um, I, I always felt there was a zen around them. I'd go out there, you know, I had to do all the chores. I never got any of the glory, but, you know, I was the, I was the hay processing manager. I, sh- I forked it in and then I shoveled it out. Um, but being around horses, um, out of out of practicality and everything else, 
you figure out early on that you need to dial everything down a little bit. Like you said, they're prey animals. And so, so being a little bit more calm, a little bit more mm-hmm. quiet, moving a little slower and just being more mellow in general, not only is good for your soul, the right. horses are way happier when you're at about 50% on the energy scale, aren't they? I agree. Yeah, I agree 100%. And, and, in addition to that, once you hit that stride with your 50%, those horses can help enhance that too. You know, if you're relaxed, the horse is going to be relaxed and that's going to in turn make you more relaxed. And pretty soon you're, you're not realizing that you are out in the middle of nowhere, just cruising around on a horse. Yeah, it's, it is a, you know, a, we have a special bond bird hunters and bird dogs working with our dogs is uh, there's nothing it's unrivaled but add a horse to the mix and uh, and there's another bond in there and it, it 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 is pretty cool and you know the only advice i would add to that is um learn which side of the which which end of the horse to uh swing wide of <laughs> Even That's the right. even the mellowest horse, when startled, uh, will react with a kick. Yep. And if you wake him up from a nap, cruising around the end of the trailer after lunch or something, you know, you, you might be in for a surprise. So. Yeah, that's for sure. So, and remember that. Hey, I bet you didn't know that. Somebody out there, yeah, they sleep standing up most of the time. Not all the right. time, but most of the time. <laughs> Um, so describe a hunt for us, Jeff. Uh, and by the way, you're listening to the Upland Nation podcast. That's Jeff Gillespie with Tinker Kennels and Rocking Horses Hunt Club. I'm Scott Linden, the host. So tell us how that hunt works, Jeff. So this it plays out. I will uh, typically pick up our, our group of hunters. Um, we take a maximum of four people out at a time. So it's not a big group. Usually it's... Uh, you know, it's it's buddies or or family whatnot. Pick pick folks up in the morning, uh, right around eight o'clock. Usually, we head to our uh, hunting grounds. We have different areas. Most of them are within an hour drive. Once we get out there, then then we start prepping. You know, uh, the basic groundwork. You know, tighten up saddles, make sure stirrups are right, put scabbards on. And then we then we loose a couple dogs and, and hit the field. Our braces are anywhere from, depending on the weather, anywhere from you know one hour to two hours. And we usually do three or four braces a day. Again, depending on the weather, we take breaks in between each brace. We switch dogs out. We have snacks, drinks, and then we stop for lunch at noon. We we grill uh, burgers or brats or or ham and cheese you know whatever we have a hot lunch and then uh, same thing in the afternoon a little break for lunch head out again in the afternoon Uh, usually we stay on one property for the day there's more than enough acres we could never cover the entire ground that that these ranches have and uh, then we then we head back home after that it is an ocean of grass out there, and it's not the only thing out there. But why don't you describe the lay of the land for us, Jeff? I am uh, intrigued with this, and if I ever move, look out because I may become a neighbor. <laughs> that sounds good. Uh, it, it, you, if you think of the, everyone calls us flatlanders out here, you know, and if you think about it, it really is not flat. It's it's rolling hills. It's flat enough that you could drive a tractor over it, but but uh, it's rolling hills and it's full of natural prairie grass. And then uh, it's spotted with uh, ag ground. And so we, we take advantage of that just like the birds do. And you know, depending on the year and the amount of rain that we get, the grass can be anywhere from six inches high to uh, knee high. And it's absolutely perfect habitat for these prairie birds. And and we're talking sharp tails and prairie chickens for the most part. Although once in a while we'll bump up a pheasant here and there, won't we? Yes, absolutely. Yep. And and you kind of scratch your head and wonder what the heck they're doing there because that's just not you know typically if you want to hunt pheasants you're going to hunt a, a crop row, 
But uh, every once in a while, you find a rogue one that got booted out. So, yeah. What is the ratio of uh, prairie chickens to sharp tails on a typical hunt? It is, let's see, two years ago, we were actually harvesting more prairie chickens than we were sharp tails. And uh, last year, it was about a 50-50, and I, I expect the same this year. And I know that some of the properties that maybe you hunted with Bob had more sharp tails than prairie chickens, but we are seeing more grass with less uh, egg around, and that I think leads lends to the to the higher density of the prairie chicken. Yeah, from what I know and what I read and steal from other people who are much more knowledgeable, uh, the sharp tails are to a degree a little bit like pheasants in that they don't mind a little bit of civilization exactly yeah yeah you could you could drive the edge of a stubble field and, and hunt sharp tails all day long uh, and, and i don't think you would be able to do that with a prairie chicken they yeah. they might come to the stubble field for food but if you want to find them after that they're going to be out in the middle of that grass tinker kennels.com just like it sounds you can't forget that tinkerkennels.com is where you learn more about jeff and Teresa and their operation you stick around jeff i'm going to give you a, a little break here everybody else we're going to get back into it we're going to talk strategy we're going to talk some of the more practical aspects of hunting the prairies all coming up in just a moment meanwhile it's flea season. <laughs> yeah, if you're looking for solutions, maybe some of the things you've used in the past you don't want to use anymore for a bunch of reasons. If you read the newspapers, you know what I mean. Check out the solutions at happyjackinc.com. My friends Manny and Joe Exum over there have got all sorts of uh, solutions, literally and figuratively, from shampoos and uh, powders to dd33 my favorite that'll keep them off and the ticks as well you just spray it on it doesn't last real long so you can uh, expect it to work all day but not stick around after that also some great solutions for skin and coat issues it's all at happyjackinc.com and welcome to our newest sponsor, Roughland Performance Kennels. You've seen me using them with, uh, well, virtually all my dogs on television over the years. My hunting buddy, Doug Sangle, is producing multiple colors, all sorts of accessories. Welcome to roughland.com. That's where you learn more about their energy dissipation technology, inspired by race car technology. Learn more at roughland.com. Dot com. And now let's learn more from Jeff Gillespie at uh, Tinker Kennels and Rocking Horses Hunt Club. Jeff, I know you're there. You gave I yourself am. away. <laughs> <laughs> if it's like here, there's so much pollen in the air, I wish it would rain harder. It's been crazy this year, yeah. Yeah, without a doubt. What do you, I mean, this time of year, everybody is just, they're chomping at the bit, to use a horse analogy, to, to get out and do something. But this is, you know, this is, you don't just sit back and wait for people to call you and book hunts. You, you've got to do all sorts of other things this time of year, don't you? This, this time of year is project time of year. In addition to that, it's also horse and dog training time of year, of course. So it's, uh, Teresa and I both stayed far too busy than, than we should, but it's, it's enjoyable work. So it's really not work. You got how many dogs in this string this, this time of year? Right now we have 16 dogs in our kennel and, wow. um, they're all, they're all happy in the air conditioning at the moment. So. Oh, I bet. I bet. You know, there, there are things that you learn managing 16 dogs that, that probably would be very helpful to those of us managing one or two or four dogs. Can you think of anything right off that you do that maybe we should do that we don't? Well, the biggest thing, and it's obviously it's a lot more noticeable for us with 16 dogs. The biggest thing for us is keeping things clean. 
you know, cleaning up the messes and, and on a daily basis, because if, if you let it slide, it, you're just going to spend way too much time catching up. And so that's, that's probably with 16 dogs in it. And it, it applies to having one or two dogs as well. You know, just make sure everything's cleaned up. It, it makes the place smell better, especially. So. Oh uh, yeah. If you've ever been in an indoor kennel that hasn't been cleaned up yet that day, you know what he's talking about everybody. Um, what about the training side of things? What is the number one priority for you with all of those English setters? Besides, besides pulling all the burrs out of their coat. Right. Yeah. Well, that's on the plus side, you know, that's, uh, that's part of the enjoyment of the hunt, but, uh, number one for us with, with our dogs and we have a mix of dogs. We have dogs that are six year veterans and we have dogs that are retired and we have, we have dogs that are, are rookies. Biggest thing for us is teaching those dogs to woe. Mm -hmm. When, when you want them to stop, they need to stop and they need to honor those points. And the nice thing about that is uh, when it's 101 degrees outside, you can still work on that training when you're inside. So. Well, tell me how you go about that, because uh, as listeners to this podcast know, that's a real high priority over here as well. So clue us in a little bit to how a real pro does this with that many dogs, with that kind of criticality to the command. Well, I'm not sure about the real, real pro comment, but <laughs> I, I, I would be happy to tell you how we do it. And the biggest thing... Um, I'm, I'm sure anyone that's that's worked with with dogs knows the biggest thing is that bond that you have with the dog and it's if you can establish that dog I swear to God they'll do anything for you you know they'll they'll do backflips or, or whatever you ask of them as long as as long as they love you and um, that's where we start and then of course the second part is just just like with the horses, dialing it back to about 50% because those dogs can sense what you're feeling and how you're feeling. If you're ang anxious, if you're irritated because it's 106 degrees out, they're going to know it and that's going to affect your training. And so that's, that's the big thing for us. And then from there, everything else is almost textbook as far as the woe training and, and and uh, honoring points, whatnot. So. When you're teaching honoring, are you hoping that you're going to be on wild birds in the prairie when you're doing that, or are you able to do that in the yard? We have about five acres fenced off that we basically exercise our dogs in, um, but we we can. In past years, we've we've raised chuckers and we've also raised quail. We don't have any this year, but. Um, you know, whatever we can get for exposure to those young dogs is, is, uh, that's, we do what we can to get that going. Are there any other commands that you use that, uh, that, that may be unique to a horseback hunt or is this, is this just a, you know, a bird hunt on steroids for us? It's, it is, you know, it's, it's basically it's, uh, it's being able to cover the ground, um, that you couldn't do if you were on foot and and it's being able to see things in a massive picture as opposed to one small area when you're walking with your bird dog as as far as commands go um you know I, we use the same commands that most people do the woe command which um for the most part i rarely talk to my dogs when we're out in the field unless they're stopping by to say hi or swimming in to check in. You know, I'm, I'm knocking wood as I say it, but uh, finally at, at almost four years old, my, my wire hair is starting to check in on a more regular basis than it used to. I don't know if it's great training or just his instincts kicking in, but I'm, I'm grateful for it. Do you expect that in all your dogs? It's, it's, it's pretty natural, especially with the ones that have, that have been in the field for, five six years you know they and and uh the younger ones they all take their cues from the from the veterans too so you know they come around and it's sometimes it takes a couple of years i i've had i've had uh i've got 
a couple of dogs that just came into their own this last season, right towards the end of the season, and it and it just clicked. But they were two years old, you know. So it takes patience, but you have to be able to you have to be able to guide them out in the field so that they're not too much of a knucklehead when they're when they're out there. Yeah, if you want a tip at the end of the day, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, t- tell us about y- your dogs. Uh, you know. Are you raising puppies? Are you buying puppies? And why English setters? Well, uh, I'll hit that first with the English setters. It's it's strictly about the aesthetics um, because there are so many different breeds of dogs that perform outstanding when they're in the field. And so I would never say to you, well, my English setters have better noses. My English setters have. Uh, run faster any of that that's not how it is it's it's just the sheer beauty of them cutting through that tall prairie grass and watching those feather tails um, and and wincing as they run through the briars next to the stock dams but that's 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 why it's English setters for us so yeah and for probably everybody else who has them as well and i don't blame you one bit and you know not only the briars but i i think the last time we were together we were busting through some pretty tall uh briars around a stock pond and this this the what are the it's the, these those little feathery seed pods like giant dandelions they were every we were coated in them <laughs> Yeah, I, I do remember that because I, I Bob was riding uh, my my horse that I have now. I use as my lead horse, and and that horse did not want to have anything to do with going in the cattails. Yeah, and yeah. we were trying to get the pheasants to come up out of the cattails. So, I think I ended up getting in the cattails with the uh, with my horse Elvis, and uh, I don't know if we ended up. I couldn't see what was going on, so I don't know if any birds flew or not. So. I don't remember either, but that, you know, which may be telling uh, that, I mean, that's only half the reason to go. Uh, so, <laughs> so, so how about managing your dogs in the field? I mean, they're running big, big mileage. Uh, if you, if you're riding 15 miles, they're running 30 or more miles. What are the things you do before a hunt, before the season, and then during a hunt to keep these dogs safe and healthy well the big a big thing for us is is uh pre-season conditioning just like anyone else but it's on a, a exaggerated scale for us because we start opening weekend which is the third weekend of september and these dogs are hunting all the way through the middle of november and they maybe get a day off in between hunts but with that exception they have to be in shape before we start. We can't, we can't, um, you have to be physically fit because there's not going to be any break to catch up on after that. Um, So are you able to do that on a, you know, on a, on a, uh, uh, a high mileage basis or do you do that with short sprints or where are you going for that kind of work? what we do is we we start this this time of year we've been doing it now for a couple of weeks is we uh, bring dogs out into our five acre pasture and just let them run just yeah. let them run you know and it's not especially with the veterans you know we don't we're not worried about uh, woe training or any any kind of training at all it's just a matter of conditioning yeah. and then um, we are we have a family homestead that's about an hour drive from our place. And then as the summer progresses, we're going to start heading out there, get on horseback with the dogs and, and start putting on more miles with them. And then uh, in August, we are allowed to go on the Fort Pure National Grasslands on the weekends until noon. And we can actually just operate like we're doing a hunt without the guns nice and so that that helps us increase the miles as we go but we work into it slowly so the dogs aren't uh out of out of shape by the time we start the season you know a lot uh, uh we hear more and more of this in north dakota and of course saskatchewan as well but yeah are you able to encounter birds when you're out there in august and and are are you expecting that i am yeah yeah this year especially was 
and and it's been incredible as far as bird populations the last two three years it's just been great this year their counts on the leks out on the grasslands are we're at an all-time high since they first started counting those birds so and when we're out there in august it's uh it, it's a different temperature so the birds are in different places but mm. they're still out there so that's it's nice to be able to go out there and watch those dogs do what they're going to do once the season opens and have the same effect you know sometimes i may have to get off a horse to flush a bird but uh you know I, since i don't have hunters with me i can't tell them to do it <laughs> I, I i i know what you mean and you know, you know i've ridden enough to know that uh, sometimes you'd much rather just stay up on the saddle uh what are your expectations for for your dogs when they're encountering those august birds are, are are you basically just acquainting the young dogs with how birds behave you want a special behavior out of your dogs when they encounter birds tell me about that well it's, it's a it's a touchy subject you know you want those young dogs to be bird crazy that's all there is to it um but at the same time they have to have some kind of manners you know so i typically I'll run a veteran dog with a young dog and they can cue off of each other. And so far that has been a pretty successful combination. I haven't ever had the opposite where a, where a veteran dog becomes a knucklehead like a young dog. So. Well, you run setters, not wire hairs, so you won't have to worry <laughs> about that. Uh, you know, we, we are told, uh, and I've never been to a summer camp out on the prairie, but we are told that the, one of the joys of it is the, the young dumb birds will actually cooperate pretty well and stand still when those young dumb dogs point them. Does that really happen? It does. And it actually, um, last year and the year before, there were so many young birds that there was times when a dog would refuse to go off a point and we just knew for sure there was nothing there. And you about would have to to just give that bird a boot you know yeah, yeah. Now, it, don't get me wrong that would be great if that happened all the time but not all the birds very few of them actually are are that foolish so well um you're listening to the upland nation podcast i'm scott linden the host that's jeff Gillespie with tinker kennels and rocking horses hunt club we'll get to that in a couple minutes but first before i forget because i always lose my train of thought in fact i already did <laughs> give us a strategy for for sharp tails in particular i i still treat prairie chickens as kind of a bonus and maybe i shouldn't but most of us are going to most of the time run into sharp tails more often so whether we're on a horse or we're not we're walking the prairies and our dog uh our, our dogs are working hard for us can you direct us to likely spots and and what we should do once a dog does hit a point well, it's, you know, it's, you have to, you have to follow the dog first and foremost, which I'm guilty of not doing. Sometimes I pretend that I know more than the dogs and I, and I really, I, that's just foolish, you know, mm -hmm. especially when it comes to birds, but you have to follow the dogs. And as far as uh, location of the birds, it depends on the time of day. It depends on the moisture content. If it's rained, if it hasn't rained, if it's cool, if it's hot. There's so many things, you know, in, in the morning, the birds are going to be higher up on these hills because they're trying to catch some sunshine and warm up and maybe grab a grasshopper or two. Uh, as the day warms up, if it gets up to 75 degrees, those birds are going to head for some some cooler um, areas down lower in, into the valleys and whatnot, so... Do you ever find uh, sharp tails in in some of those thickets out there? And and I don't remember what we call that that bush that's out there a lot. But do they hang out in there? They 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 do if there isn't other options. And mm -hmm. typically that that buck brush is what I call it. It's it's um, usually that's a good spot for them after a snow because it gives them a little shelter and there is some some berries that they can eat off of that stuff too mm -hmm. and so bad bad weather will put them in spots like that for sure 
We, um, I, I, I'm thinking of some of the Montana hunts I've done that have been in just brutally hot weather, and we found birds anywhere there was shade. I mean, literally one tree on a prairie, they'd all be hanging out in the shade there. Do, do we need to think about that early in the season as well? Absolutely. It, you know, and the only downside of that out here on the prairie is there's, there's not much shade. You know, you can, you can go for miles and miles without trees and, and it does make a difference though. You know, I've, I see some of those. I follow a lot of people that are, that are out in Montana with sharp tails and I see some of the videos that they post and, and it would be nice to have specific things out on the landscape where you could say, let's go there. I know that's where the birds are going to be as opposed to having 20 straight miles of grass with no trees. So how about water? Do they go to water? I've never asked a biologist about sharp tails in water. Well, I'm not a biologist, but from what I've seen, a lot of what they get for their water comes from the dew in the morning Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. off of the grass. So, and they'll eat, you know, like you said, berries with fruit, and and the bugs have got a lot of moisture in them as well. So we don't see them like like chuckers and and some quail species, you know, going to water every day, especially early in the season. Yeah, exactly. So if I'm looking at a, if if I'm a horseback and you're next to me and we're uh, about ready to cut the dogs loose, uh, where are they going to head first and, uh, and why? The dogs are, they're going to want to get into the wind. They yeah. obviously that's the, that's the easiest trick. And if it's, of course, you can't always do that. If we need to go a different direction, these my dogs are trained to cue off of the lead horse, mm-hmm. and that, and I've I've noticed that they do actually pay attention to me as well as the horse. But because I've gone days where I wasn't wearing my cowboy hat, and <laughs> they, they weren't they weren't sure what to do. They knew the horse, <laughs> but they didn't know who was sitting on top of them. But uh, but they'll, they they cue off a horse, and once we get off in the right direction, even if it's not into the wind, once once we get away from the trailer and we're going, then they're they're good. Do you um do you do anything in the way of diet and hydration for these dogs that are putting in so many miles? I mean, what what do you feed them, and why? We have a we we do a Perina Pro Plan Sport Dog. It's high fat, high calories, um, and protein. And then hydration-wise, we do have a doggy Gatorade that some of the dogs like and some of them don't. They'd rather just have water. And, of course, when we're in the field, I always have a couple gallons of water on me with the, on the saddle as well. Yeah. So, yeah, so they, when they come check in, they, they know they'll, they'll come back. When they're thirsty, they come to me. And they'll hop up on the, on my stirrup, and they'll yeah. give them a drink, and we'll be good to go. Yeah, I I love it, and 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 that is a wonderful way to do it. What is in your doggy Gatorade, uh, unless it's a secret formula, and you'll have to kill me afterwards? No, I can't think of the name of it either. I, th- I think it's one that I saw on maybe on your website, as well as that uh, that energy bar that you yeah. That you so. Good, good. Well, thank you. <laughs> um, do they? Um, do they get that same diet all year? Are you feeding the the, the high fat, high high uh, protein all year? We we yeah we do keep them on that, um, and obviously they don't have as much uh, energy burned in the off season. But we've been fortunate, and knock on wood, that our dogs are not excessive when they eat what they need to, and that's it. So no, yeah. nobody's getting extra weight in the wintertime except for me. <laughs> well, it doesn't sound like your uh, your off season is any less active, and it may be even <laughs> more active. So uh, I don't think so, Jeff. Uh, <laughs> did I remind everybody if they want more information on what you're doing, they should go to tinkerkennels dot com. Um, Jeff, 
whether we're on a horse or we're just walking around on the prairie out there. And by the way, yeah, you're nearby here, South Dakota, right smack dab kind of on the river there. Um, but you're, you know, you're within, you know, you're in that time zone most of the time. Right. Uh, just so that everybody knows about where that is. Um, what do your clients without naming names, because we do want them to be repeat clients, but what, what do, what do uh, typical clients do that you wish they would not do when they're hunting? I, I think a big thing um, for us, and it's not a, a fault per se, but it's getting our hunters to hunt prairie birds instead of hunt quail or hunt pheasant preserve. Yeah. And trying trying to explain that it's an entirely different hunt uh, with these birds. And you know, it's if you go to a pheasant preserve, which is a great hunt, uh, it's it's not the same. You know, these birds do not act the same. If, if you lollygag when you're getting out of the saddle and, and, and you stop and you decide you're going to load your gun or, you know, or, or brush a piece of dust off and then you meander up to where the birds are there, they're, they're long gone. They, you know, they, they either walk away or they fly away and, and they don't walk slow and they don't fly slow and they don't stop. So that's a big thing for, for us is, is trying to make sure that people understand that, that you've got to be quick, out of the saddle, you got to be quick up to the birds, and you got to hunt them like they've been hunted all their lives, because that's the way it is with them. Yeah, they are truly wild, and by wild you mean nervous, don't you? Yes, absolutely. If you if you see a hawk in the sky, I can guarantee you you're going to have to kick a bird to get them to fly. Yeah, which uh, you know sometimes we wish for that, don't we? <laughs> <laughs> And I, this is the year I'm finally going to put a hawk call on my whistle lanyard so that I can get some of those chuckers to hold still for a, at go. least 10 more steps. <laughs> so we'll see. It, how about bringing our own dogs? Well, you know, be, be frank with us, because I know dogs and horses, uh, it's a volatile combination. Would, would you want us to bring our own dog? We, we are very comfortable with that. I've, I've never had any, any issues with um, – with folks bringing their own dogs. Um, we've actually, we've, we've had clients come that uh, you bring their dog along and, and the dog's not even a bird dog. He just wanted to come along, bring him along for, and so the dog would just walk with us while we mm -hmm. were riding. Mm -hmm. um, but, and, and I've had folks who brought um, their hunting dogs out and, and spent most of their time walking because anytime they got on the horse, the dog would just throw a fit about it. They didn't do anything to the horse, but they were mad because that, hunter wasn't walking with them isn't that so. fascinating you know <laughs> I, I guess i shouldn't be surprised at that that you know if you got a bond with your dog and all of a sudden you're four or eight feet higher than you were yeah um you know that's that's confusing if nothing else do you um <clears throat> do you have anything in particular that you uh, advise people to um to uh bring with them when they're uh when they're riding on a hunt as opposed to just walking? Well, a little extra padding on, on your hindquarters never hurt anyone. Uh, our saddles are, <laughs> saddles are comfortable, but, uh, you know, they're not the old just bare leather saddles or anything like that. But, you know, three days will catch up with you. And then, and also, of course, some, some good hunting boots. You don't have to wear cowboy boots. It's not a, it's, it's a Western experience, but it, it, we're not ranching. We're, we're not moving cattle. We're, we're hunting birds. So some good hunting boots that, that you can put some, some uh, ground time in once you get out of the horse. Back in the day, um, we were worried about our boots getting caught up in the stirrups because they were truly, you know, stirrups were designed for a certain kind of footwear. These right. days, your, yours are oversized and anything almost anything will fit in there right yeah you can do just about anything except for maybe you know some some heavy duty wintertime big big boots that you wouldn't want to wear when you're hunting anyways so. and um of course the the number one rule when you're riding is never to say yee am i right 
that works. Yes. And don't affect a Western accent either. But, uh, <laughs> you know, if you were going to leave us with one, one bit of advice about uh, hunting in general, uh, hunting wild birds in general, uh, what would the Tinker Kennels and Rocking Horses Hunt Club philosophy be? Our philosophy, I would say, would be it's it's about enjoying and appreciating what you have out there in the middle of nowhere in a sea of grass, beautiful dogs, a smooth ride, and worry less about filling your bag and worry more about just appreciating where you are amen to that i will just echo all of that and more you there's a special connection to our past to our ancestors to the ground to the people who have trod that ground in the in the past it's a magical experience it is a connection to your dog and the horse that you will never get from anything else it is something that everybody should put on their bucket list and when they're ready to go tinker kennels.com is where to do it jeff great to talk with you again thanks so much for being a part of the upland nation podcast thank you scott it was good to visit again same here i've got a public access tip for you kind of more practical coming up in just a moment but first speaking of dogs and getting dogs in shape Foods are, well, I guess it's a minefield out there when you talk about dog food, and uh, everybody has their own claims. But Dr. Tim Hunt is a veterinarian. He's a sled dog competitor. And luckily for us, he's developed some great dog foods for these performance-oriented animals. If your dog is hunting a lot, what's important to that dog is fat, protein, at high levels and carbohydrates at low levels the quality of the fat and the quality of the protein are critical not only because you want him eating the good stuff not the feathers the tendons and the bones but because the good stuff has omega-3 fatty acids and antioxidants you get all those only with the right combination of proteins animal proteins and the highest animal fat content. Learn more about all that stuff and why you might consider changing at drtims.com. And as an added incentive, you'll get 30% off your first order if you use the code Upland Nation. This land is your land. At least a lot of it is. And while we know about the, you know, the usual suspects when it comes to accessing public walk-in hunting ground, I've done a little exercise that uh, might be of use to you as well. And in fact, if you would like more of this, I've got a whole list at my website, findbirdhuntingspots.com. This will get you started on some of those less common public ground opportunities that you might want to look at. And, you know, just talking to Jeff about South Dakota, I'm reminded of one Bureau of Reclamation patch right there on the Missouri River that is certainly worth taking a look at. So, U.S. Bureau of Reclamation. The easy way to start is usbr.gov slash recreation. Find out which of their properties are available and open to hunting. You know, usually they're around water of one sort or another. They manage a lot of dams, a lot of reservoirs, that sort of thing. And speaking of dams and that sort of thing, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers is another great source, both for camping and for hunting. Take a look at them. And then U.S. military bases. You don't have to always be active duty or retired military. Sometimes they have spots that are open to you. If you'd like to learn more about those, it's iSportsman.com dot net 
more and more I'm learning about state parks that are open for hunting. Of course, private timberland, paper companies, and that sort of thing. And then hydropower, dam, and irrigation district properties, they're all there. Just make sure you find out exactly who owns the place and get permission if you need to. Do a little digging. And you'll be surprised at how few other people are worth are are are, are willing to do that digging and you might have that place to yourself. Again, if you want all of those on a list, at least to get you started, go to findbirdhuntingspots.com. That'll do it for today. Thank you, Jeff Gillespie at Tinker Kennels. That's tinkerkennels.com for more information. You know, the best way for us to grow and spread the word about conservation, wild bird hunting, bird dogs, and all the magic that comes from all of that is for you to tell one friend that they might want to listen to the Upland Nation podcast. Thank you in advance. And if you want to talk anytime, just go to the Facebook pages, Wing Shooting USA or Upland Nation. Thank you to our sponsors. Welcome to our new ones here on South Dakota and Roughland Performance Kennels. To everybody on Facebook whose suggestions and advice are helping all sorts of fellow hunters. I'll leave you with this from Charlotte Gray, author and pretty good person, obviously. She says, a dog desires affection more than its dinner. All right. Well, almost. I'm Scott Linden. Thanks for listening to the Upland Nation podcast. Tell a friend. See you in the field.